ladies and gentlemen, the meeting will come to order. Pursuant to applicable law and my determination that attendance by remote means is necessary because an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent due to the declared public health disaster caused by COVID-19, this meeting will be conducted by a video conference. Let the record reflect that this is a public hearing being held pursuant to the requirements of Section 147F of the Internal Revenue Code of 1986 as amended. Notice of this public hearing was published on December 4, 2020 on the website of the Office of the City Clerk of the City of Chicago. Let the reporter mark the screenshot of such notice as this committee's exhibit number one for identification, and this will be included in the notice of the record. We'll now have a roll call for the TEPRA hearing. Alderman Hopkins. Sorry, Alderman Hopkins. Alderman Dow. Here. Alderman King. Vice Chair Harrison. Alderman King is present. Thank you. Alderman Sawyer. Here. Alderman Mitchell. Present. Okay. Alderman Harris. Alderman Beal? Yep. Thanks, sir. Alderman Garza? Here. Alderman Thompson? Here. Alderman Cardenas? Alderman Quinn? Here. Alderman Burke? Alderman Lopez? Live from Brighton Park. Alderman Moore? Present. Alderman Curtis? Alderman O'Shea. Here. Alderman Brookins. Here. Alderman Tabaris. Here. Thank you. Alderman Scott. Present. Alderman Burnett. Here. Alderman Urban. Alderman Talaferro. Present. Alderman Raboris. Present. Chairman Wags back is present. Alderman Austin. Here. Alderman Villegas. Present. Alderman Mitz. Alderman Spazzato. Nick Spazzato is here. Thank you. Alderman Napolitano. Present. Alderman Riley. Present. Alderman Smith. Present. Alderman Tunney. Present. Alderman Osterman. Present. Alderman Silverstein. Present. Ladies Austin and gentlemen, Anderson is present. Thank you. Alderman Cardona is present. Thank you. Chairman? Yes, is this Alderman Burke? Uh, did you get me? I don't know if you heard me. I said, oh. Yes, I, I did. I saw your uh, name on there. Thank you. Thanks. Alderman Cardenas? Alderman Hopkins? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a hearing regarding a plan of finance to issue a not to exceed $12 million principal amount multifamily housing revenue note for the Paseo Boricua project, the multifamily housing note. The proceeds of the multifamily housing note will be used by Paseo Boricua Arts LLC, an Illinois limited liability company herein referred to as borrower to pay for costs in connection with the acquisition of real property located at 2709 to 15 West Division Street in the city and the construction thereon of a five-story mixed-use building that will include two floors, two through five affordable housing, consisting of 24 apartments comprised of eight studio apartments, eight one-bedroom apartments, and eight two-bedroom apartments, together with the pertinent facilities located on the first floor of the project, and with a first floor compromised of community space, commercial retail space, and a black box performance theater. The initial owner of the property, including the project, is the borrower. The city will enter into the multifamily housing note pursuant to its powers as a home rule unit of local government duly organized and validly existing in accordance with the provisions of Article 7, Section 6 of the 1970 Constitution of the State of Illinois and an ordinance adopted by the City Council of the City. 
The multifamily housing note will not be a general obligation of the city, the state of Illinois, or any political subdivision thereof, but will be a special limited obligation of the city. The principal of premium, if any, and interest on the multifamily housing note will be payable solely from amounts received from the borrower to repay the city's loan of the proceeds of the multifamily housing note and from any other funds pledged and assigned to the repayment of the multifamily housing note, except to the extent such principal, premium, or interest is payable from multifamily housing note proceeds, the income from the temporary investment of the multifamily housing note proceeds, and monies derived from instruments delivered in connection with the borrower's loan. The multifamily housing note will not constitute an indebtedness or an obligation of the state of Illinois or any political subdivision of the state of Illinois within the purview of any constitutional limitation or statutory provision. No holder of the multifamily housing note will have the right to compel any exercise of the taxing power of the city, the state of Illinois, the United States of America, or any political subdivision of any of them to pay the principal of premium, if any, or interest on the multifamily housing note. Written comments relating to the plan to issue the multifamily housing note must have been submitted by email to the Director of Legislation and Policy at owen.brew at cityofchicago.org, not later than 3 p.m. December 11, 2020. Let the record reflect that there were, no, there were no written comments submitted. Ladies and gentlemen, if any resident, taxpayer, or other interested person attending this hearing desires an opportunity to express their views for or against the proposed issuance of the multifamily no housing note, please notify the host um, on this toll-free call -in number so you may have an opportunity to make those comments or statements at this time. Is there any member of the public, taxpayer, inter interested person who wishes to make a statement with respect to this matter? Let the record reflect there has been no response to the question posed by the chair. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the public hearing of the proposed plan for the city of Chicago to issue the not to exceed $12 million principal amount multifamily housing revenue note for the Paseo or Equa project. Let the record reflect that the public hearing on this matter concluded at 1043 a.m. December 14, 2020, and this concludes the TEPRA hearing. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll now move to the Committee on Finance. Um, that we had some other people that came on. So um, the Committee on Finance is hereby called to order. The time is 1044 a.m. on Monday, December 14, 2020. Pursuant to applicable law and my determination that attendance by remote means is necessary because an in-person meeting is not practical or prudent due to the declared public health disaster caused by COVID-19, this meeting is conducted by video conference. For questions during the meeting, I ask that Alderman please use the raise your hand function to indicate they have a question. Members of the committee uh, shall be given preference. If you wish, pardon me. If you wish to make a point of order, point of information, or point of clarification while one of your colleagues is speaking, please use the raise your hand function. We will now have a roll call to establish quorum for the Committee on Finance meeting. Again, please unmute your microphones when your name is called. Um, and we will start with Alderman Brian Hopkins. Alderman Hopkins. Alderman Dow. Here. Alderman King. Present. Alderman Harrison. Present. Alderman Sawyer. Here. Alderman Mitchell. Here. Alderman Harris. Alderman Beal. Yep. Alderman Sedlowski Garza. Here. Alderman Thompson. Here. Alderman Cardenas. Alderman Quinn. Here. Alderman Burke. Alderman Lopez? 
Here. Alderman Moore. Present. Alderman Derek Curtis. Um, could staff make sure that um, the Zoom link is sent to Alderman Curtis again, please? Alderman O'Shea. Here. Alderman Brookins. Here. Alderman Tabaris. Alderman Scott. Present. Alderman Burnett. Present. Alderman Urban. Alderman Talia Farrow. Present. Alderman Member Boris. Present. Chairman Wagstax, present. Alderman Austin. Here. Thank you. Alderman Viegas. Present. Alderman Mitz. Present. Alderman Spazzato. Nick Spazzato is here. Thank you. Alderman Napolitano. Present. Alderman Riley. Present. Alderman Smith. Alderman Tunney. Present. Alderman Osterman. Present. Alderman Silverstein. Present. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Hopkins. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a quorum. We have 32 members present. We do have Chairman. three members. Yes. Is Chairman, that did you call Alderman Smith? Yes, I did. I, I, I'm sorry. I got you. Alderman Smith. Alderman Tavares. Alderman Burke. And Alderman Curtis. Chairman, did you get me? Yes, I do now. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. I apologize. Oh, man, That's okay. Difficulty, I guess, on both ends today, huh? Uh, a lot of Zoom issues with numbers. Alderman Curtis. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we do have a quorum. Uh, 33 members present. We have uh, three members of the public who signed up for testimony today. And as such, we will proceed with that part of the agenda. Each person will have three minutes to speak. We have uh, Kevin Crafney, Craig Chico, and Rhonda McFarland. Mr. Kevin Crafney will start off. Mr. Crafney. Uh, Chairman, I don't see Mr. Crafney. Okay, we'll give him a second there. All right, how about Mr. Chico? Good morning, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Craig Chico, and I'm the executive director of the Back of the Arts Neighborhood Council, our organization that served the retail and industrial businesses in the Back of the Arts for over 80 years. As a service provider for four uh, SSAs and the Leary and the NBDC, we've had much experience in promoting many city services and programs, and today we'll be speaking namely about SPIF, Small Business Improvement Fund. So I'm here before you today to speak in favor of this uh, SPIF program in its entirety and also the proposed changes you will have before you for your consideration. Over the past three years, the BYNC has assisted over 15 businesses acquire SPIF funding. The majority of those cases were in commercial corridor and those completed projects, I am here to tell you, without SPIF assistance would not have gotten done. The diversity of the businesses within our community were well represented and included three restaurants, a child care facility, a woodworking company, a shoe store, a needle craft store, a jewelry store, a hair salon, and a tax service. The industrial recipients, in part, included a trucking firm and an envelope manufacturer. Without uh, being dramatic, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, many of those businesses may not have survived without uh, these projects and the assistance. Some of those projects included kitchen upgrades, roofs, windows, HVAC, flooring, and overhead doors. For us, the only tool in our, at our disposal to retain and assist those businesses many times is SPIF. It is also one of our greatest assets when trying to attract new businesses to our area. As for future projects and those under consideration by business owners, the proposed changes in this ordinance will make a difference, sir. 
raising the amount of grant funding to 90% of total eligible project cost and raising the maximum grant amount to 150,000 in commercial and 250,000 in industrial areas will be the determining factor in proceeding or not for many of those businesses. Escrow funding will also make this grant friendlier to the recipient and may ease the stress of upfront borrowing, which has been an impediment for years. Although these changes will not completely eliminate the barriers of accessing this capital, it will assist us in the struggle of getting money in the hands of those that truly need it and for those who form the foundation of these corridors and make up the, the backbone of our neighborhood economies. The struggles we have had connecting businesses with this program are usually businesses that have no tax returns or a tax return and financial that shows little or no income, no banking relationships, and or no equity. With the increase of marketing and business support proposed in this ordinance, being incorporated in this ordinance, I should say, many of these impediments will be addressed. These changes go a long way in connecting the intended recipients and the intended business recipients and underserved and disinvested communities to this SPIF funding. So on behalf of the Back of the Arts Neighborhood Council, we fully support these changes and ask this body to pass this ordinance in its current form. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Thank you, Mr. Chico. Appreciate your comments today. Next, we have Ms. Rhonda McFarland. Ms. McFarland. Chairman McFarland is not here. Ms. Okay, thank you. Uh, did Mr. Craftney come back on? Uh, no, sir. Okay, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that is all that we have for members of the public speaking today. Uh, I want to make note that Alderman Maldonado uh, joined us via phone. So Alderman Maldonado. Excuse me, still? Mr. Chairman. Sorry. To yes. My understanding is that uh, um, Ms. Rhonda McFarlane, that Ms. Rhonda McFarlane is on the phone. Okay. Uh, That's me. We can pause for just a second. Um, Kamala, can you try to see if uh, you can get her back on there, Ms. McFarland? Sorry, this is Ann Emerson with the staff. 773-268-7232 is the only number that we have there that's unidentified. So if that's her. If, if McFarland is here, uh, then she would be on a computer because that's the only phone number. So uh, if she can raise her hand, we will know. Okay, Ms. McFarland, can you can you raise your hand on the participant side? Chairman Dowell. Uh, yes, um, um, Chairman, she says she's on a phone. The number is 312-626-6799. And if uh, that number is not there, then, you know. Chairman, she, she may be on the, the other Zoom call. Remember, we switched uh, numbers. Is that, that a chance? There's only one Zoom channel, so there wouldn't actually be another available channel. It would give her a, an error of some kind, a message error. Okay. Um, okay, Chairman right. Dow, what, what was her name? What was her number again? I'm sorry. 312-626-6799. Okay. Yeah, we don't have anything. I checked all the other numbers here. We don't have that. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, what we can suggest is that she submit uh, any testimony through the chair, or if she sends it to you, and we can um, try to get that in the record. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, getting back to the regular order of business here. Um, were there any other aldermen that came in late due to the lateness of the Zoom uh, hosting numbers. Alderman Curtis, Chairman. Thank you. Alderman, Alderman Curtis. Curtis, Chairman. I got Thank you. you. Thank you. And Alderman Hopkins. Alderman Cardenas. Okay. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, 
Ladies and gentlemen, you should have in front of you the minutes per, of uh, the last meeting per Rule 45 from September Committee on Finance meetings. Thank you for being patient with the distribution on this. Summation of all three meetings was quite uh, an undertaking this month, but I want to thank everyone for attending the meetings and for your thoughtful questions and suggestions. Does anyone have any changes or questions on this item? Riley item moved through pass. Okay. Um, I have a motion from Alderman Riley to approve item number one using the roll call used to establish quorum. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Thank you, Alderman Riley. Ladies and gentlemen, item number two is actually from the Department of Housing. This is a matter we held uh, the TEFRA hearing on. Uh, this is in the 26th ward. Please note that there is an error on the agenda as mentioned in the notices and at the TEFRA hearing. The amount to be issued is up to $12 million. This will be corrected in the summary report and the reports out of this committee. The ordinance seeks to issue up to $12 million in multifamily program funds. Oh, um, in execution of a funding loan agreement with Seo Bariqua Arts LLC for the construction of affordable housing at 2709 to 2715 West Division Street. The project is in the 26th ward as I mentioned. Alderman Harris, you have your- Hi, I was, yes, I just wanted to be present for the quorum count. Thank you, Chairman, I have you. you. Um, Dinah Wayne from the Department of Housing will join us to testify on this matter. And uh, I believe that Alderman Maldonado is on the phone, so we will have him close on this item. Ms. Wayne. Actually, Mr. So, Chairman, it's Tamara Collins. Right. Uh, if you could repeat yourself, thank you. It's actually Tamara Collins from the Department of Housing that we will we'll be presenting on Paseo Bariqua. Okay, thank you, Tamara. Please go ahead. Thank you. I My can apologies. Just, no problem. Just quickly share my screen with you. There, hopefully everyone can see this. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Tamara Collins and I'm the project manager with the Department of Housing. The ordinance before you requests authority for the city to amend its funding, ag funding agreement with Paseo Barrique or Arts LLC. As a reminder, the development team is a partnership between Brinshore Development LLC and the Puerto Rican Cultural Center, a local nonprofit in the community. The proposal includes the demolition of, sorry, still back here. Hang on here, thank you. Apologies. The proposal includes the demolition of several vacant and dilapidated buildings located at 2709 through 15 West Division. Pardon me, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty on this side as well. I'm happy to resign. That's okay. But let's go back here. There we go. Um, here we go. Thank you. So the proposal includes the demolition of the several vacant and dilapidated parcels, which are located here at 2709 through 15 West Division. to make way for the new construction of the Paseo Barrico Arts Building. The new construction includes a five-story residential building with a green roof, rooftop outdoor space and rear, uh, rear building parking. The ground floor contains office and common space areas, retail space, and a black box performance theater. And the unit mix consists of 24 affordable studio, one and two bedroom residential units on floors two through four. In April of 2019, the city council approved a bond inducement ordinance allowing the city's intent to issue up to $12 million in tax exempt bonds. 
in June that the final amount was anticipated and approved at $6 million. Since that time, construction costs have significantly increased pushing hard construction costs closer to $10 million and requiring the city to issue additional bonds to allow for all eligible bond expenses to be covered. While the final bond amount issued for the project at closing will not exceed what is necessary for the project to guard against any future increases in construction costs or need for additional bonds, the Department of Housing is requesting authority to issue bonds in the amount not to exceed $12 million, which was the amount originally approved by the bond inducement ordinance. At this time, I respectfully request your approval on this ordinance to remain on agreements, which will allow for the construction of the Paseo Barrico Arts Building to be located at 2709 through 2715 West Division, located in the 26th year. I'll be happy to take any additional questions at this time. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Are you able to uh, put your video back on? I think. Yes. Uh, and Alderman had a couple questions there when you're done. Sure. Um, and again, on this one, this is 26 Ward. If Alderman Maldonado wishes to close, we'll have him do so. First question is from Alderman Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, not a question, just uh, compliments. Mm -hmm. um, I just like to commend uh, my colleague Alderman Maldonado for staying true to the cause, BOS, um, and uh, making sure he keep affordable housing in his community, but also uh, keeping that uh, Boricua uh, flavor um, in Humboldt Park. Uh, if you if you notice, uh, you know, most of the affordable housing that that he uh, have built over in Humboldt Park. It generally has um, the light um, colors as you would have over in Puerto Rico or, or in a, in a uh, high clim hot climate area. So I just want to commend him on uh, staying true to the cause, staying true to his culture, and helping people to continue to have affordable housing. Congratulations to you, Alderman, and to the administration for supporting you on this. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Burnett. Alderman Lopez, Raymond Lopez. Thank you, Chairman. Actually, I just had a question uh, with regards to the construction costs. I think, Ms. Collins, you stated that it, it jumped about $4 million from 6 to 10. What was the cause for that 60% increase? So actually, it, the, the total increase was about $2.2 .2 million, which pushed the construction cost to, to about $10 million. Um, so in this case, right after we had gone to city council, um, the general contractor that was originally, had originally bid on the deal pulled out. The project had to be rebid, and we ended up with the new GC, and that caused the, um, it's been a little while since the project had been rebid initially, so the, that caused construction costs to go up. What was the time difference between original bid and rebid? Uh, the original bid was uh, in mid 2018. Um, the last bid came in sort of, I believe, at mid 20, the end of 2019. So in one year's time, 20, I should say. Correction, in two years time, Ms. Collins, we saw this price jump over $2 million. $2 million yeah. And what was the reason? Construction costs. Just blanket construction costs. It just seems like such a high, I mean, you're still putting up a wall the same way. You're still buying the same amount of bricks. I'm just curious how a $2 million jump happened in two years time, other than just blanket construction costs. Was there? That's actually not unusual. Oftentimes when we get projects in, they come in the door initially. By the time we get to the full underwriting of a project and um, by the time we get to even closer to closing, those costs can, can increase over time. So projects, when they first come in the door at the time, um, come in with really what is just with, with an estimate. So by the time we get to city council, we expect those numbers to be solid. But in this case, because the general contractor left um, and without knowing exactly the details of why he chose not to pursue this project, it could have easily been, maybe it wasn't bid properly initially. Um, but in this case, there's a new GC. They came back with new numbers. We did get an, three additional estimates. Um, 
when the project came back in the second time. And this was actually the lowest of the three bids. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Tunney. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, first of all, I want to commend Alderman Maldonado for this unique uh, mixed use with the affordability and the commercial. Um, I, I was more concerned about the ground level. And if I'm not mistaken, there are arches, and maybe a question for whoever, maybe tomorrow, tomorrow or somebody, is there recessed ground floor setbacks uh, uh, or those, are those arches uh, or windows uh, right up to the street on division. I just, I believe, yeah, those, those entryways are recessed back a little bit. I can okay. show you the screen again if you like. Please. And tomorrow. So what is the what is the recess? How much is it set back in the there? Like two or three feet? No, I, I apologize. I don't have that that specific of detail. Okay. But here's the here. Let me see if I can pull up the other one, which was a little bit closer. Okay. So you can see. All right. This is the actual. I can pull that a little closer. Yeah. Can you see that? I do, and you know, I'm I'm not an architect by by trade by any stretch, but from a public safety perspective, we've had buildings like this with recessed. Uh, entryways and it has been a problem um, in our neighborhood for just people hanging out or loitering in in the recessed areas and on commercial we actually like to have the frontage all the way to in the division street so there might be some artistic reason for the for this but that's just my concern about you want to highlight the commercial point and having them recessed for three feet minimizes the impact that could happen, whether it's the theater or the commercial space. Um, so that's just my two cents worth. Um, the design looks, especially on the arches, looks, in my opinion, a little dated, but maybe maybe the alderman might have a comment on that. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Alderman Hopkins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, please add me to the attendance roll call. I was uh, stuck in Zoom purgatory for a while there, so, uh, but here I am. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. I recognize that was a problem, so we, that's why we're kind of waiting for people to come on there. Um, Alderman Cardona. Thank you, Chairman. Well, thank you. Thank you for attending the meeting. This is Mr. more Chairman, of a statement. Um, this is Alderman Maldonado. Um, let me know whenever I can be recognized. Thank you. Yes, uh, Alderman Maldonado, we just have Alderman Cardona that's going to speak, and then I'll hand it off to you. Yes, thank you. Go ahead, Alderman Cardona. I want to commend uh, Alderman Maldonado on his vision and basically bring affordable housing along to Visit Street Paseo Boricua. Um, this is an outstanding architectural uh, building that's gonna it's gonna go well into Division Street. Um, to be quite honest, uh, it's something that I grew I grew up on Paseo Boricua, and it just I am so proud that we're gonna be having this building there, especially for affordable housing and how it looks in the, on that street. It's more a statement than anything else. Thank you, Alderman Roberto Maldonado, for doing this for our community, especially Humboldt Park, and especially um, for the culture of the, of the Puerto Rican community. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. 
Uh, I don't see any other aldermen with their hands up, so I'm going to hand it over to Alderman Maldonado to uh, Ald oh, Alderman Maldonado. Hold one second, please. Alderman Hairston. Um, I just I just want to congratulate the um, aldermen on uh, this project. Um, I've done. Uh, Brinshore has developed in my ward, and um, we they've done an excellent job. Uh, they're very conscientious and concerned about the community. Um, so I just wanted to add my congratulations. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Alderman Maldonado, you're all set. Thank, thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of the members that have made some positive comments about this long-awaited uh, uh, development. This is a development six years plus in the waiting. Uh, this was the vision of my late wife, and I'm so pleased and humble to say that this development is going to be named after her, Nancy, Nancy Y. Franco Maldonado Arts Building. The beauty about this development is, go is that it's going to be 25 uh, new affordable units lit and work for Latino artists, the first floor is going to be a 100 feet uh, live performing arts, and the commercial space next to it is going to be a is going to be a Latin American wine bar with spirits from the Caribbean. And all of this was the the, the dream and the vision of my wife. And I'm so humble and pleased that I'm getting the support from so many members from this committee. And uh, and I want to thank. Commissioner Navarro and Commissioner Cox, because they've been very supportive of this development from the very beginning. Thank you so much, um, um, Mr. Chairman, and I hope to get a, um, uh, 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 a yes vote on this project. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Maldonado. I'm sure you will. It's an excellent project. And uh, with that, on item number two, may I have a motion for approval by same roll call used to establish quorum. So Don't move, Chairman Alderman Lopez. Moved by Alderman Austin. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And the motion on item number two carries. Thank you, Alderman Maldonado, and congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, item number three. Item number three is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance regarding the authority to issue bond inducement language regarding tax exempt housing revenue bonds issuance for the acquisition and development of properties at 1800 to 1812 West Roosevelt Road and 1801 Greenshaw Street by the Chicago Lighthouse Residences 4 LLC. This project is in Alderman Burnett's 27th Ward. Ms. Tamara Collins from the Department of Housing is here to testify today on this matter. Ms. Collins. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Chairman. Give me just a second to share my screen here again. Sure, and I'll have Alderman Burnett uh, close on this item as well. When he's ready. We can see it there. Great. All right. Uh, good morning again, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Tamara Collins, project manager with the Department of Housing. The proposed ordinance before you requests authority to declare the city's intent to issue up to $13 million in tax exempt bonds to the Chicago Lighthouse Residents LLC and its affiliates for the acquisition and development of properties located at 1800 through 1812 West Roosevelt Road. The site is located in the 27th Ward and within the Illinois, Districts, uh, Illinois Medical District's PD30. The building will be located adjacent to the Chicago Lighthouse headquarters and constructed on the existing parking lot shown here on the site.
The project was selected through the 2019 tax credit funding round and the developer includes a partnership with Brentshore Development LLC and the Chicago Lighthouse for the Blind and Visually Impaired. The proposed new construction includes a nine story multifamily building targeted to low and moderate income families and special needs population, including those who are blind and visually impaired. The ground floor includes office and common space areas to support the building, a small retail space and interior parking on uh, the first through third floors. Floors four through nine include 76 affordable rental units with the mix of studio one and two bedroom units on each floor and each unit has one bath. In addition to the indoor parking, the site will also include outdoor surface parking for a total of 59 parking spaces and each unit has a, for a total of 59 parking spaces, open space and a play lot. The total project cost on this development uh, is the total of $36 million. This will include a mix of 9% tax credits, tax exempt bonds, 4% tax credits, and a multifamily loan. As a reminder, this is just for the bond inducement. As the, uh, the project will have to return to committee for final approving on all the financing of the project. But at this time, the department is respectfully requesting your uh, your approval to declare it's the city's intent to issue up to $13 million in tax exempt bonds for the project, uh, the Chicago Lighthouse residences at 1800 through 1812 West Roosevelt Road. At this time, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Are there any questions from the body? Okay, seeing as there's no questions, Alderman Burnett, would you like to say anything on this item? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one, uh, Brescia Michaels does uh, several developments in my ward, all affordable low income housing. Uh, they're very popular. They to, uh, they Alderman Burnett, you're, uh, you're a little muffled there. Sorry. They go out of their way. There you to, go. They go out of their way to make sure that uh, uh, everything is holistic, that the community get all the resources that they need to be a viable uh, neighborhood and they bring people together. Uh, <laughs> I really appreciate the type of developer that they are. They, they spend extra money to make sure that people uh, live in, in, a, in, a, in a good, stable way. Um, this partnership with the uh, Lighthouse for the Blind, um, you know, came to me several years ago and I was very elated to hear that they want to do what they, they're doing. They do a lot for people that are blind. Um, uh, as you may know, uh, even though I have bifocals right now, as, as a lot of people get older, um, they start to lose their sight. Uh, this organization attends to you know, all of the things you could imagine that a, a person may need if they don't have a good sight. Uh, matter of fact, uh, you know, they, they, they even um, encourage to have uh, stoplights on the corner so that folks can hear well uh, if they can't see uh, the cross to, to cross the street or not. Um, they have been a very viable part in our community. We appreciate them. Uh, this is going to help a lot of people who may be losing their sight uh, to be able to have a, a building that's built that's conducive to what they may need to get around uh, in that building, but also to get around in a community that respect uh, the concerns that they may have. So I, I support this 100%. I thank the administration, the Department of, the Department of Housing, and everyone that's involved uh, with this project. And I appreciate the committee's support on this. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Burnett. Uh, before we vote on that, Alderman Austin, you had a question? Uh, no, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just want to be recorded as voting no. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, are there any questions for Alderman Burnett or Ms. Collins? Okay, on item number three, with the exception of Alderman Austin, may I have a motion for approval by the same roll call used to establish quorum? So moved, Chairman. Alderman Lopez. Moved by Alderman Lopez. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. 
Aye. All, the, all those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Thank you, Alderman Burnett. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Alderman, uh, Chairman? Yes. Alderman, oh, Alderman Irvin. Irvin. Yeah, could you add me to the roll? I apologize. I, I didn't know the meeting had started, so apologize That's okay. We had, that was a Zoom information issue. Um, I have you down for the quorum. Thank you. Okay. Uh, on that vote, with the exception of Alderman Austin, that motion carried. And um, item number four. Item number four is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance regarding the authority to enter into and execute a redevelopment and subordination agreement with Greater Auburn Gresham Development Corporation and Greater Auburn Gresham Support Corporation, supported by tax increment financing and master lease for office space and build outs at 839 to 845 West 79th Street. This project is located in the 17th Ward, Alderman Moore. Alderman Moore, I'll have you close on this item. Uh, first, we will hear from Terrence Johnson from the Department of Planning, who will testify on the details of this matter. Thank you, Chairman. Share screen here. Whenever you're ready. Got it. You can see it there. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, Chairman, Waggis Pack, and members of the Committee on Finance. For the record, my name is Terrence Johnson, Assistant Commissioner in the Department of Planning and Development. I am also joined today by Carlos Nelson, the Chief Executive Officer of the Greater Auburn Gresham Development Corporation. I am here today to request the approval of a redevelopment agreement between the City and Greater Auburn Gresham Development Corporation, or GAGDC, for the purpose of rehabilitating the vacant building at 839 to 845 West 79th Street. This agreement will authorize the use of 2.1 million in TIF assistance for the project. The project is located in the Auburn Gresham Community Area, 17th Ward, within the 79th Street Corridor TIF District and along an Invest Southwest Priority Corridor. This map provides a bit more uh, neighborhood context. The building itself is outlined in red and, and sits on 79th Street, um, just between Green and South Peoria. Um, and as you can see, it's, it's uh, just a block away from the critical intersection of 79th and, and Halsted here. I also note that the property is immediately across the street from city-owned property that is outlined in yellow and is the subject of a recently re released RFP. This is the building as it currently stands today. Uh, it was originally constructed in 1926, but has been vacant for the last uh, 20 plus years. The developer is proposing to redevelop the property into an approximately 50,000 square foot multi-tenant office building focused on health and wellness providers, as well as community and workforce development organizations. The first floor will be anchored by UI Health and Broadway Pharmacy. GAGDC will also be relocating their offices to the property as well. The total project cost is an anticipated 15.4 million with 2.1 million or 13.6% coming from TIF. Funds for the project will come from area-wide increment and will be provided in as two equal installments made at the issuance of the certificate of completion and the first anniversary of that issuance. In addition to TIF, the project budget includes 3 million in proceeds from the Prisker Travel Foundation Chicago Prize, 2.8 million in new market tax credits and 4 million in CDBG funds provided through the Federal CARES Act. Shown here is a rendering of what the building will look like upon completion. DPD is in support of the project because it will eliminate a large vacant commercial space in the neighborhood and provide a catalyst for further growth on the corridor. Additionally, the focus on healthcare will increase access to services to low and moderate income clients. And finally, the project will lead the creation 
of 65 new jobs in the neighborhood, as well as 68 temporary construction jobs. Thank you for your favorable consideration of this request. Mr. Chairman, I, as well as Mr. Nelson, are happy to answer any questions you or the committee may have. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, hold one second here for Alderman Curtis. He has a question. Alderman Curtis. Uh, no question, Chairman. I, I just want to uh, say that uh, the Greater Auburn Gresham uh, Organization is an awesome organization. Not only do they do great work in Auburn Gresham, but they also does great work in the surrounding communities. Uh, so uh, I support this project and uh, congratulations uh, to Alderman Moore also. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Curtis. Alderman Michael Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanna congratulate uh, my colleague, Alderman Moore. I know how hard he works out in his community and, and uh, the work that he does with his, his community residents and I think this will be a great help to him and his community. And so I just wanted to give him kudos. Uh, I know this is a hard road and, and, and he's seeing the end and the, the fruit, fruits of his labor. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, it does look like an excellent project. And um, before I go to Alderman Moore, Alderman Burnett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I also like to commend uh, Alderman Moore uh, I tell you, Alderman Moore is so deep into that community. It's, it's amazing. I uh, appreciate uh, him continuing to push uh, to make things happen in his neighborhood. Congratulations to you, man. I see greater things happening in your work. Thank you. Um, Walter, your, uh, your sound goes a little bit in and out. So uh, I don't know if you need to get closer to it, but we did hear most of that. All right, thank you. Thank I don't you. Know what it is, but thank you. Okay, just a heads up. Thank you. Alderman Moore, if you'd like to close on this. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, first of all, um, everybody tend to hear, I use a phrase called teamwork makes the dream work. And I appreciate um, the congratulations from my um, colleagues, but um, no one man is an island in himself. And I appreciate the hard work, first of all, of uh, GAGDC, especially under the leadership of Carlos Nelson, who had the vision um, for this. So it was his vision, uh, bringing it to me, and then we worked um, through some um, challenges, some painful challenges, and we were able to um, work together to get um, to this point. But we wouldn't also be at this point without Mayor Lori Lightfoot. I know some people say that in terms of every time a mayor does something, we just say thank the mayor. But in all honesty, um, she really got involved um, in this. And um, I really want to thank her and commend her for having this focus on, on the corridor for Invest Southwest. So um, Carlos um, and GAGDC had the vision for this um, um, project, but then it began to spur other things along the 79th corridor. Um, um, the uh, Metro Station is coming up there um, under the leadership of State Senator Jackie Collins, um, coming right at 79th and Low, which is just blocks away um, from this healthy hub site, which is really needed because we need a healthy um, focus in our community. But also, uh, what wasn't mentioned is going to be a restaurant on the first floor as well, and so it brings some not it brings some revenue um, to the community as well. And then just down the street. Um, the Jerk Villa is uh, opening up and rehabbing a building that has been um, abandoned and vac vacated and um, making it look like what their project is in the South Loop area off of 22nd in Michigan. And so, uh, and again, just further down, we opened up a new cafe, Cafe Brewer at um, 79th and um, Sangam and, and then Leo High School is looking to expand. And then as th it was mentioned before, we already have a RFP um, that has interest in the um, vacant site, the vacant city site right across the street. So already you're about to see a community become totally um, transformed. And I wanna thank um, the mayor and her administration for really um, being committed to this and working on this. And, and again, GAGDC and Carlos Nelson um, for their commitment. So I do ask all of my um, colleagues for their um, vote and support on this project. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alderman Moore. 
Uh, on item number four, I have a motion for approval by the same roll call used to establish quorum from Alderman Derek Curtis. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion on number four carries. Thank you, Alderman Moore, and congratulations. Thank you all. Thank you. Item number five is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance regarding the authority to enter into and execute an intergovernmental agreement with the Illinois Housing Development Authority, IHDA, to reallocate a portion of the city's unused tax exempt bond volume cap for 2020 to facilitate financing of affordable housing or qualifying mortgage loans by Ida. Ms. Uh, Wayne, or will it be Ms. Collins from the Department of Housing will join us to testify on this matter. Uh, Ms. Wayne will be joining today. Oh, okay. Ms. Wayne, okay. Uh, go ahead on that item if you could. Thank, Thank you. you. Let me just share my screen. If I can, just a second here. Oops. Well, while I'm, you guys can't see it yet, right? Uh, no, not yet. Okay, oh, wait a minute, let's try this. Okay, well, it's just text, there are no visuals anyway, so there's a summary okay. of what I was going to say. Oh, can you see it now? No, but if it's, uh, oh. if it's text, you can just go ahead. Yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna continue Thank you. then. Okay. So and then we'll take, uh, we'll take questions after you're done reading through that. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Dina Wayne, and I am a financial planning analyst in the Department of Housing. I respectfully request your approval to transfer bond cap to IDA. This bond cap will otherwise go unused and will expire. On average, the city receives about $269 million in bond cap every year to help fund and develop affordable housing. We know this as our 4% tax credit or tax exempt bonds. The city allocates around 20 to $30 million of this bond cap for affordable multifamily developments. Every year, nearly $200 million of this allocation goes unused and expires because the need for additional cash subsidies, because of the need to allocate additional cash subsidies for the, to leverage these bonds. Members of the committee, I respect your support for an ordinance to transfer $170 million of the 2020 tax exempt private activity bond volume cap to IDA. Transferring this portion of the city's volume cap to IDA enables them to develop much needed affordable housing before the bonds would otherwise expire and cannot be used. Thank you and I'm available to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dina. Um, and I believe if you were going to forward that text as well, we can we can enter that into the record um, if there was anything. Sure, we'll do. Um, ladies and gentlemen, are there any questions for Ms. Uh, Wayne? Okay. On item number five, may I have a motion for approval by the same roll call used to establish quorum? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Alderman Hopkins, moved by Alderman Hopkins. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and this motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Wayne. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, item number six was a communication recommending a proposed ordinance regarding the authority of the Department of Water Management to enter into a preliminary water supply agreement with the city of Joliet. CFO Bennett will join us to testify on this matter. Good uh, morning, Chairman Wagesback, Vice Chairwoman Harrison, and members of the Committee on Finance. I'm here to discuss with you Ordinance 0-2020-5784, preliminary agreement with the City of Joliet regarding an anticipated water supply agreement. Last year, the City of Joliet issued a request for information for a new water source. Joliet is looking for a new water source because the aquifers that they currently use are expected to be depleted by 2030. Approximately a half a dozen options were considered, and in January of 2020, the Joliet City Council decided upon two finalists. The City of Chicago proposal is one of the final two that Joliet is considering. The other is a new intake that Joliet would build in Hammond, Indiana. Under this agreement, Chicago would charge a customer rate based on the American Waterworks Association, or AWWA, 
and one methodology for rate setting. This AWWA rate setting methodology calculates the costs of providing water service to our customers and determines a rate based on that cost of service. The way that AWWA calculates the water rate is to take the cost of the operation and infrastructure for all parts of providing water service from the intake in the cribs to the treatment plant to the tunnels to the pumping station and allocates that cost to each customer based on cost of service and their usage of water. The AWWA M1 methodology is an industry standard for rate setting and is used by several regional water utilities such as Dallas, Philadelphia, Detroit, Evanston, and many others. In addition to a new method of calculating the rate, we also recommend establishing a new advisory council for the city of Chicago to share information about water operations and to allow suburban customers to collaborate with Chicago on ways we can make water operations and rate setting more transparent, fair, and efficient. If Joliet chooses Chicago, it will require construction of additional infrastructure at the Southwest Pumping Station and at Durkin Park, as well as the 31 mile pipeline to Joliet. Under the preliminary agreement, Joliet would pay for the entire infrastructure improvement. Total construction cost is, is projected to be between 592 million and 810 million. The city would own the tunnel extension as well as the low service pumping station being built next to the Southwest Pumping Station. Joliet would also own infrastructure beyond the meter, meter vault, which would include the new suction well, the high service pumping station, as well as the 31 mile pipeline to Joliet. Construction of infrastructure would take approximately two years in Durkin Park and the Southwest Pumping Station at 84th and Kedville. Once completed, we expect the park to be restored to its current condition with certain improvements for the community with a small suction well underground beneath the park. Joliet is planning for two potential scenarios for water demand. One is a 30 million gallons per day or MGD scenario where the water demand is solely serving the city of Joliet and its retail customers. The second is a 60 MGD scenario, which would serve several well water communities around Joliet. The anticipated revenue from the contract would be nearly 30 million a year. The Joliet City Council will make their choice next month. If Chicago is selected, we would seek city council approval again next year for a final water supply agreement. After that, final design would occur 2022 to 2024 with construction following in 2025 to 2030 with water starting to flow in 2030. In closing, we recognize that the water supply industry is very competitive, but we believe that the city of Chicago offers Joliet several advantages of which I'll highlight two below. One, the city of Chicago has the number one and number eighth largest water treatment plants in the world. We provide water to over 5 million customers and over 120 communities in Northeast Illinois. The choice to buy water from Chicago is not just about treated water, but it's about the institution and the expertise that the Department of Water Management and the City of Chicago can provide. Secondly, Chicago provides some of the best water quality in the world, including winning over seven awards over the last 19 years. Chicago has taken very seriously protecting Lake Michigan as a water source, and we believe the water quality of the Department of Water Management is one of the best in the world. With that, I'm happy to take any questions or comments you may have. Thank you, CFO Bennett. Um, I'm gonna have Alderman Curtis close on this. Are there any other questions from Alderman? Chairwoman Dowell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, CFO Bennett, when I was briefed on this, there was mention of improvements to a local park in Alderman Curtis's ward. Yeah. I didn't hear you speak to that. And my question is, is that um, uh, memorialized or codified anywhere so that that work actually gets done? Are you put, have you put the money aside for that? So as a part of our discussions with Joliet, we have um, discussed community improvements above and in essence replacing the park as well as various other improvements. We've had discussions with the park district, which have had discussions with uh, the community as well about what they'd like to see. Currently, uh, Durkin Park has a baseball diamond, which we understand they um, actually like to see soccer fields um, installed in that facility. 
um, as a part of the negotiations that we'll undertake in uh, between our, um, our, our hopeful selection in uh, January and then the final water supply agreement. That's the document in which we would memorialize um, the details of uh, the improvements that would, um, that would get included. Uh, and we'll bring that final uh, water supply agreement before council for your approval as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Alderman Urban. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one quick question. Uh, the revenue number was pegged at $30 million annually. Was that for 30 million uh, gallons per day or for 60 million gallons per day? Um, so the number that we provided was nearly uh, 30 million. Uh, for 30 and 60, um, it's somewhere, it's basically within the $20 million range and it varies by a couple million dollars. Um, at this point, the water um, uh, you know, supply will um, change between now and 2030. And so it's hard to say exactly um, you know, where the value of it is, but we think it'll be roundly near the $30 million range. And that's for, for how much water? Um, for um, either 30 or four or 60 MGD. So how could it be 30 million for twice the water? You're, so, you're, so I'm nearly, just trying to understand. The 30, it was for the, the 30 MGD is where the nearly 30 million references. Um, I will get you the precise number for the 60 MGD. Okay, so the 30 that you're talking about currently is for the 30 million is for 30 million gallons. Right, that's correct. So okay, small. that's that's what I that's what I just want to understand. Okay, yep. thank you I very will, much. I will get back back to you on the sixty million number as well. Okay, we'll get. Much. Thank you, Alderman Irvin. We'll get that to everybody through the chair so that everyone gets that number. Um, Alderman Lopez. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, Ms. Bennett. Um, real briefly, if I may ask uh, a few questions. Um, how much will this, what is the total that we collect from municipalities annually for water service? So we, we, the water department has about 700 million in revenues a year of which about half of it comes from our regional water partners. So about 350 million from other municipalities and regions, and this yeah. will be about a 10% increase with this yes, new agreement. Yes, that's correct. And how much are we, uh, how much are of our, uh, how many of our partners are uh, defaulting on their payments and are in arrears with our city at the moment? Um, there are a handful of those partners. Um, I can get you the precise numbers around that. It could be a rough approximation. I know we discussed this during budget. Um, Ms. Bennett, you're muted. Sorry. It's about 55 million. Okay. Um, I bring this up because my question is, you stated that we're gonna use a new calculus to determine the rate for uh, our partners. Uh, will that also be something that gets entertained for the rest of our municipal partners as well? Um, yeah. And will we have, and will that cost us money or will that generate more money as we reevaluate what our rates will be moving forward? So overall, um, based on an evaluation of the rate setting, the new AWW8 rate setting should generate pretty much the same rate that we're collecting now in terms of, uh, in terms of what we collect from our regional partners. And so it, um, it won't be more or less, it'll be basically about the same in terms of what we're generating now. I think what's really important though about this uh, new rate setting methodology is it creates um, additional transparency and frankly trust with our um, regional water partners so that we can stabilize the broader region and build um, a community in essence of uh, water supply and ultimately bring more water customers into the fold. Um, well, I'm sorry, do other states use that as well? Or is it something that like, I'm assuming if we use it, that must mean Indiana does not, or, or do they use it as well? Regional, uh, AWWA you mean? Yes. Yes, actually, AWWA is best practices and frankly is how most water utilities charge rates. Um, as I mentioned in my comments, um, Detroit, Philadelphia, uh, Dallas and others um, all use the rate setting methodology um, of, of AWWA as do some of our regional competitors. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Alderman. 
Um, Alderman Curtis, I was going to have you close, but did you have uh, a question first? Uh, no, just closing is fine. Okay, thank you. Alderman Cardenas? Hey, thank you, Chair. I, I'll be quick. I, I just wanted to congratulate, obviously, uh, CFO Jenny Bennett on this. Um, uh, are there other entities, uh, not just Juliet? I know you're going to look at uh, the surrounding areas of Juliet, can join in on that, which I think is phenomenal. Um, it, we should do all we can so they can join uh, in this effort. But there could be other municipalities, um, notwithstanding the fact that some are not paying well, but um, we have a great asset. We ought to, we ought to uh, expand that uh, the resource, um, uh, great utility that we got to take advantage of, and I think we could do more. But do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that, um, and uh, I appreciate those comments. I think all we can do to sell our water system, it is one of the best in the world. And um, importantly, we also want to make sure that we're um, collaborating with our regional partners. Over the last year and a half, we've engaged in a dialogue with um, nearly all of them, and in particular, um, our largest customers as well. And we're looking to build upon those relationships as we move forward. So, um, you know, this isn't just about um, revenues for the city. So, um, you know, we believe um, we can be uh, good partners in how we provide water supply more broadly. But no idea how many more are out there or, or who could be next? Um, we have uh, heard about a few communities that are potentially looking to change their water source. Um, and so those are um, active, ongoing conversations. Um, some have been in the works for years and some, you know, are just starting now. And so, um, you know, we've kind of been engaged with a number of them in order to try to see if we can sell water to more as well. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. And I have you down as present for purposes of the quorum. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. One second, please. Alderman Villegas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, CFO Bennett, um, as it was stated earlier, uh, one of my colleagues mentioned that 10% of that um, new business would be with Joliet. It, what, uh, what other municipalities are we looking at that could potentially tap into Joliet? Um, Joliet has a number of well uh, water communities around its um, around the city. Um, there are around the about 20 or so of them that also um, will need to transfer their water source. Um, what, what's uh, happening ultimately is that the underground uh, aquifers are being contaminated with road, road salt and radium. And so um, they um, have a need to transfer um, and uh, Lake Michigan provides a great opportunity for that. Um, that's, um, that's the reason why they have a 30 and 60 MGD option because if they are able to create a water commission, um, which in essence would be a um, broader uh, a regional um, set of, uh, uh, of potential water customers, then it could be a potential for a much bigger um, you know, amount of revenue. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, answer, um, CFO right, Bennett. I, what, what, it, what, what I want to say is that this is something that's, that I'm glad to see that we're embarking on. This, there's, uh, um, we have to be very competitive um, as the, uh, although we're the city of Chicago with, with, the, with the largest facility, we, we, you know, we can't rest on that. We have to be very aggressive in uh, seeking new customers. So I appreciate the fact that we're doing that and uh, you know, please let us know how we can help. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Alderman Thompson. Alderman Thompson, are you ready? Sorry, yep, you, uh, my froze up there. Um, so, All yours. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, so I, and I apologize because I've been uh, multitasking here. So if you talk about this, Jenny, um, uh, I forgive, uh, forgive me and I missed, uh, I couldn't be at the briefing for the schedule. So who's paying the construction of that pipe so joliet will be paying for the construction we'll about the this. structure improvements joliet is yes that's correct and but who owns the pipe so as it relates to the pipe and the infrastructure improvements the city will own the tunnel extension and the low lift pumping station that will be built right um, adjacent to southwest pumping station and then joliet will own um, the meter vault the suction well the high service pumping station and the pipeline going out to Joliet. OK. 
Okay. So the, the pipeline, I'm just looking at the, the rendering we have. So the blue pipeline, the finished water transmission main is going to be owned by Joliet. Yes, that's correct. And it's owned, operated by Joliet and paid for. Owned, operated and paid for by, by Joliet. And they'll just bill their customers for that. Yep. Okay. Um, because as it relates to some of the things we're talking about, well, let me go back on something else. I mean, we're, Great Lakes, um, we're governed by treatises with Canada, with other straight states and Great Lakes. Um, so the allocation that Chicago gets mm -hmm. um, is, is limited. So we don't have an unlimited amount of money or mm -hmm. water we can take out of there. What is this? How much are we taking out for Joliet? Is so the amount of water Joliet volume? Joliet's going to be applying for their own IDNR um, allocation, so we won't be using our allocation for them. So, oh, have they gotten it? Um, they're in the process right now of, of uh, applying for it. So this deal is contingent upon them? Yes. Getting it? Okay. Yes. Okay, so we don't have any, any the only thought would be, um, you know, that water main that goes down as we talk about other communities, um, in order to transmit it, um, you know, it would be nice if that line could be the main trans, you know, the main that would come out and you can branch off of there for other communities down in closer to Joliet. But um, if Joliet's going to own that line, that answers that question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Alderman. Alderman Osterman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Jenny, how long is the contract for? Or would um, it be for? Sure, it's a 50-year contract with 10-year uh, renewals thereafter. Okay, and a little bit following up on uh, Alderman Thompson's question. Are there other, besides our city council action and the Joliet City Council taking action, are there other state or federal entities that have to sign off on the deal for the diversion? Um, at this point, we understand that the state of Illinois through the Illinois uh, Department of Natural Resources needs to provide an allocation to um, uh, uh, Joliet, as we you know just talked about. Um, other than that, we're not aware of any other um, you know, actions that need to be taken. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Alderman Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jenny, just a uh, just a thinking out of the box question. Mm -hmm. um, have we ever thought about bottling our water and selling them at concerts and festivals and venues like that and making some money off of it? Um, I I have not, um, but we could take a look at it. I love I love Chicago water, so um, you know any chance we get to sell water? Get all those out of town people to buy. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's my only question. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Um, Alderman Curtis, ready? All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think uh, when, when we were going through the bidding process for uh, this project, I did give a letter of support. I gave my letter of support because I Alderman, you're breaking up there. This is a win-win for the city of Chicago. Uh, this will be to the city of Chicago. How about now? Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, right. we can. Uh, Sorry, this, will be, this will be, this will be, this will be, again, I, I uh, did give my letter of support uh, for this project. I think it's a great project. Although, uh, what, what I didn't do was see how Joliet paid their bills. Uh, but uh, this is a win-win project for the city of Chicago. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a out, of, out of no cost to the city. All the money will be coming from the city of Joliet. Uh, so I, I'm asking my uh, colleagues to support this because um, I, again, I think this is a great project and it's, it's well needed for the city of Chicago. 
uh, that's it. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Alderman Curtis. Um, I've also reviewed the project, and I know that uh, CPD, or the Park District, was working closely with you um, on that. So thank you for those comments, Alderman Hopkins. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm in full support of this. Uh, it's it's the right thing to do. Uh, it's the right thing to do for the region um, and for the surrounding municipalities, not just Joliet, but the uh, uh, nearby municipalities who can subcontract with them uh, to the point that was just raised. Uh, Joliet pays their bills. Um, in fact, uh, we would do well to have Joliet's municipal bond rating uh, right now. Uh, we're in no position to uh, look down at some of our regional partners given the conditions that we're facing. So there's absolutely nothing to be concerned about there. If they enter into this contract, they will live up to the terms uh, in good faith, I have no doubt. So um, I would uh, urge a favorable uh, vote for this and uh, hope that the uh, contract comes to fruition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Alderman. Um, and I, I agree with you there. I think uh, when you look at this project, um, I've been working on it a little bit with the CFO and with the water department. There's a couple other notes I think we should point out. You know, in, the, in years past, we didn't really have a great relationship with a lot of our suburbs and our surrounding, uh, not just water clients, but in general. And I think what we've seen here over the last uh, year or so is a genuine effort to reach out to a lot of our partners in the region, especially with Joliet. As a lot of you know, Joliet's running out of water in 2030. The aquifers uh, are drying up and, and they won't have access to uh, potable water um, within just a few years. So this was very important for Joliet. Um, the city of Chicago is competing with Hammond Indiana on this deal. And as a lot of you know uh, where they're situated, I think we, we have better access to cleaner water. Um, we have a, a water department that has incredible engineers and incredible staff. Um, if you have been able to tour uh, one of our plants, um, you can see what kind of work that they're doing. And it was incredible to watch our engineers as they spoke with engineers from Joliet and made a pitch um, for the use of Chicago water. Our engineers were um, just in terms of the technical expertise and future thinking, uh, they're ahead of the curve. And I was very impressed uh, listening to how they spoke about water um, access, water cost, and really the, the trust in, um, in how we uh, work through our water system. So uh, what I've heard from uh, Randy Connor in the mayor's office as well, and from CFO Bennett is that we do have a position that we're looking at to also coordinate uh, water issues. And that person will be working with all of our partners out there in a way that we have not seen before. So I think this is excellent for not only the future of Chicago financially, but for our partners out there like Joliet, who uh, not only them, but this, the surrounding communities need that water. If you want to take a look at what they're doing in terms of uh, thinking through this process, working through it, Joliet has a website that if you Google uh, Rethink uh, Water Joliet, um, or Rethink Joliet, they have a, an excellent website for how they're working through a lot of these issues of, of access, cost, and, and participation with their community partners, or regional partners like us. So um, I think it's an excellent uh, read over the next few weeks, and hopefully with the effort that's been done by the Water Department, and the CFO and all of her staff, all the engineers down at the, our plants, uh, that this will not only uh, pass here in our city council, but be received favorably in Joliet. So with that, um, I have a motion from Alderman Hopkins for approval by the same roll call vote uh, used to establish quorum. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? And in the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it and the motion carries. Thank you, CFO Bennett. Thank you, everyone. Great, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, item number seven is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance regarding the authority to execute the 59th amending agreement with Summer Corps 504 Inc. as administrator authorizing tax increment financing to TIF's fifth new project areas 
of 51st and Archer, Stevenson, Brighton development areas and various established small business improvement funds or SPIFs. We're joined by Mary O'Connor and Nora Curry from the Department of Planning for testimony on this matter. And uh, I know there's some questions on this, so we'll, we'll work through those, but um, we have both of the staff here to first give a presentation and then take your questions. So with that, I will hand it off to uh, Ms. O'Connor. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Mary O'Connor, Deputy Commissioner in the Department of Planning and Development. I am here to request your support for the substitute ordinance of the 59th amending ordinance to amend the rules and procedures of the Small Business Improvement Fund Program and to authorize the execution of an amendment to the existing administrative service agreement with Summer Corp 504 Inc. I would like to begin by thanking you. We have had the opportunity to speak with many of you as we prepared this ordinance. Your questions and insights have resulted in a much stronger proposal and we appreciate your collaboration. The Small Business Improvement Fund is a citywide program. Since 1999, SPIF has invested $104 million in grants to 1,400 small businesses in 96 TIFs, from Sauganash to Bronzeville and from Mount Greenwood to West Rogers Park. When SPIF celebrated its 20th anniversary, we took it as a challenge to make this already successful program even better. And we think we have met that challenge with this ordinance. The goals of this ordinance are to implement a transparent long-term plan to build a more equitable city and stronger business corridors while providing more effective tools to sustain small businesses and position them for future growth. In support of those goals, the ordinance before you today takes three primary actions. First, it activates a three-year SPIF funding plan, authorizing a total of $60.2 million in 60 SPIFs to be allocated over three years. Secondly, it updates six program rules. And thirdly, it changes the structure and rate of Summer Corps compensation. Summer Corps is the SPIFs program administrator. The first primary action is the three-year funding plan. City Council authorizes SPIF funding for each individual TIF district. Once funding is allocated, DPD and Summer Corps work with local partners to roll out the funds for applications within each SPIF district. In the past, DPD required new SPIF funds on a quarterly basis. Community partners, your offices, and local delegate agencies would just have about a month or two to notify potential applicants, which gave the applicant little time to prepare while meeting the deadline. The three-year funding plan will allow you, our delegate agency, and community partners time to plan, market the program, and recruit applicants. And applicants will have more time to prepare applications that better meet their business needs. Application rollouts will be posted at least six months in advance. We believe over time we will see stronger demand and better applications leading to serving more businesses. The second primary action is the, in the ordinance is program enhancements. As we celebrated SPIF's 20th anniversary, we also began convening focus groups made up of small businesses, SPIF recipients, delegate agencies, and other stakeholders to identify new enhancements to the program while also addressing the unprecedented impact of the pandemic and civil unrest on small businesses. Between the feedback from the focus groups and the feedback from the aldermen and alderwomen, we have identified several program enhancements. To highlight a few, the ordinance proposes the following. Increase the maximum grant amount from 100,000 to 150,000 for commercial projects and 150,000 to 250,000 for industrial projects. Increase reimbursements up to 90% of project costs for commercial projects. Create an escrow option for, for project funding and update the design requirements, which will give applicants better design tools to benefit their businesses and their commercial corridors as a whole. Finally, the third primary action in the ordinance is to update summer course compensation structure and rate. Over the past 21 years, the SPIF program has been administered by Summer Corps, a nonprofit organization. We began this par partnership serving five TIFs, 
Over the course of the program, SPIF has funded projects in 96 TIFs. Summer Corps is recognized and respected by our delegate agencies and applicants for their expertise, professionalism, and guidance in getting these projects to the finish line. As the program has evolved, Summer Corps has continued to meet the challenges and demands and has been instrumental in the program's success and growth. With the additional enhancements to the program, we recommend changing the structure and the amount of Summer Corps compensation. Currently, Summer Corps is paid 7.25% of project costs at completion. We request a change in the structure, paying 1% at rollout, as well as increasing compensation to 8% at project completion. In closing, we ask for your support for the substitute organs before you. We are excited to bring the enhanced BIP program to the business community, and we're ready to hit the ground running this January. Our team is, um, is available and present today to address any of your questions. And Chairman, um, per your approval, Manny Flores, President and CEO of Summer Corps is present and he would like to um, speak. Well, thank you very much, Mary, uh, for that presentation. And um, I'm going to give the floor to Mr. Flores, a former colleague of ours as well. Uh, Manny, are you there? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. And committee members, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. It really is, uh, it's, it's an honor. And I sit here with uh, gratitude and, and a tremendous amount of pride. Um, I want to thank all of you for your, your service to our communities, the work that you do, the connection that you have with, with constituents and your leadership. I also just briefly want to thank uh, Mayor Lori Lightfoot, uh, Commissioner uh, Maurice Cox and the entire Department of Planning for their work and, and leadership uh, as we move our communities uh, forward throughout the city of Chicago. Now, Mr. Chairman, I know that uh, we're, we're short on time and I submitted a statement. It's, it's probably longer than the time that you would uh, uh, provide me. So I would just ask that the statement be provided to members of the committee and that it be placed on the record. But let me just uh, summarize my statements um, by, by again, just reinforcing what um, what Mary just indicated, that this program, the SPIP program, is one of the longest running programs that we have in the city of Chicago when it speaks to economic development and the support that we offer small businesses. And I need not tell this, this uh, August body right now, you know, small businesses are the backbone of our community, but let's make no mistake about it. Right now, they are under duress. We are dealing with uh, some pretty uh, uh, severe economic headwinds. Um, thankfully, we have uh, the, the vaccines coming online. We see some light at the end of the tunnel, but the economic hardship that these small businesses have suffered uh, is going gonna, is gonna to take a while for us to pivot and, and to rebound. So I would submit to you that, you know, one of the reasons this is such an important program and the work that we're doing here today is critical is that the SPIF is an important tool in our toolbox. It has a proven track record. And it's going to help us be able to provide that additional needed support that our small businesses need throughout the entire city. Um, that's another point that I think needs to be re, uh, underscored is that the SPIF program is one that really touches almost every TIF and that touches just about every corner of our city. I would also submit to you and just reinforce again that the SPIF program is also an opportunity to help businesses that have been historically underserved. Uh, so we're talking about minority owned businesses, women owned businesses, and also an opportunity to strengthen um, and to further support other initiatives that we have coming online, such as the Invest South uh, Southwest program. I would also just say uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, for the opportunity for Summer Corps to serve along as a partner to the city of Chicago, and that we look forward to continuing that work. Um, again, with a, a priority on customer service and making sure that we do our best to help the, the business of the city of Chicago. Well, thank you very much, uh, Manny. Good to see you again here. Um, I know some of our colleagues have worked with you in the past on the council, so I'm sure we all send our wishes to you and thank you for coming on. Um, ladies and gentlemen, before we get into the substance of the discussion, um, can I have a motion from Alderman Riley to accept the substitute? Motion, uh, no moved. All right, thank you, Alderman Riley. Uh, you now have in front of you the substitute. This was sent out uh, Friday, 
and um, I believe a couple times in between. So we'll be working off of the substitute ordinance. Um, all those in favor of uh, motion to accept that substitute, say aye. 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 All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and the motion to accept the substitute passes. Um, Alderman Cardenas. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Just uh, I want to congratulate uh, uh, Manny. Uh, I think he was better off in the council, to be honest with you. But uh, uh, great to see you, Manny. You're looking great. Great things at uh, a summer core. Uh, I know you get appointed there. And I know you're making things happen. Uh, this BIF is it's a lifeline to many businesses, as you know. Um, and, you know, some of our tips obviously are being replenished. So that's a great thing to see that. Um, uh, hope you get to, to do more across the city you know, with the SPIF. We've used it uh, with great effort tremendously for, for some of our business corridors. They've um, uh, really been grateful for, for that. And I know through uh, your efforts now and, and your team uh, are helping so many businesses uh, in, that are in dire straits right now. So thank you. Uh, keep up the good work. And, uh, you know, we need your back in politics. Those, the debates were awesome. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Cardenas. Alderman Osterman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, just want to lend my support to this um, revised SPIF ordinance. Um, as we look at the next couple months and next year or two, um, this enhanced SPIF program and this ordinance is going to give flexibility to help small businesses really kind of retool and get back on their feet and be ready for when things are somewhat back to normal. So I think it's, it's an important tool that we're using. Um, I will say one thing, you know, Summer Corps is a challenge to really make sure that the SPIF program, this is a challenge also to the department, that it's user friendly to small businesses and that uh, chambers of commerce, community organizations and elected officials know how to use the SPIF program well and what's possible. So I think um, as we move to revise this ordinance and pass it, I think uh, all the interested parties need to really double down on making sure that people understand how we can utilize the tool to make it most effective. But uh, today I stand in support of this and urge my colleagues to support it as well. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Uh, Alderman Lopez. Thank you, Chairman, and good morning. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, excuse me, committee members. <clears throat> um, I just want to share some of my frustrations I have with this. I do understand SPIF is a very useful tool. Um, a number of my businesses have used it, um, but the frustration I have is more with the department. The department that has no problem using TIF funds for its issues while failing to answer local aldermen's TIF requests throughout their, throughout their, in their wards throughout our communities in the city. Um, I think we need to have a, a greater discussion on what we do in using TIF um, collaboratively, not just at the whims of the department uh, for this. Uh, the other issue that I have with this new SPIF is I do think making it easier and something that businesses can plan on is a wonderful idea. I wanna commend you guys for that. Um, but I also am concerned because SPIF as it's written, and uh, Mary or Alderman, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of the uses for the SPIF have not changed to address the reality of COVID. And, it, and I believe I'm safe in saying that. Most of it deals still with facade maintenance and a number of the, uh, like the HVAC, the heating, cooling, some of those things. Um, but we haven't really been able to modify this in a way that helps us ensure that those businesses that we're trying to upgrade still exist past 2021 past COVID. Um, and I'd like to know, um, is there a, a thinking towards modifying SPIF program to ensure that it is for, it will be able to also help businesses survive the pandemic, not just get a facelift during a pandemic. And whomever would like to answer that, I'm happy to. This is Alderman, Manny. I'd, I'd like to defer to, to Mary. Um, hi, Alderman. Um, well, a couple of things with the um, the pandemic and the civil unrest that was before us. We did adapt some of our um, 
some of our policy to address it by increasing the grant reimbursement up to 90% as well as um, the amount of funding up to 150,000. But I do, um, I recognize where, where you're, what you're trying to address here. And um, I know so many of our small businesses are, um, you know, may easily go under and it's because we need help and support for operational costs. And, um, right. and so I, so we have been exploring this. We haven't gotten to a, um, a good place or we haven't gotten to an answer to address this. It is a state statute. It's going to take time, but it is um, something that we've been exploring with Alderman Nugent, but um, probably not working at the speed that everyone would have hoped to um, get to. But we all recognize as a program that this is a 20 year program and it can never continue just to be the same. We have to con continuously amend this and address the needs of our small business community. So Mary, if I may ask, um, what part of the state statute does not allow SPIP to be used for uh, things beyond the eight or nine different classifications? And I, I understand that increasing the threshold for grants is a wonderful thing, particularly when many businesses are faced with cash and liquidity issues. However, um, I think it's the number of options that SPIP can be used for that is the problem. So is that something that has to be changed in Springfield? Or is that something that we can tweak ourselves um, as the executors of this program? Um, I think it's twofold. One is um, the state statute um, in, it, um, forces us to stay within those rules, which is it's a capital improvement for permanent in infrastructure and not operational. So that's number one. But the second is if, if we um, want to consider other maybe eligible uses, that is something that we can discuss um, and that's on a policy level. So, so would you, so would you be, I'm sorry, excuse me, Mary, would you be able internally in the department consider outdoor dining and things of that nature as a capital expense and correct it internally moving forward during the three, the next coming, the next three year cycle of this program? Because my concern is that, you know, yes, there's benefit to having a three year program but we also lose the ability to be nimble and uh, adaptive at the same time if we're not you know, having mechanisms in place to do course corrections as we, as we need them. Case in point, you know, all of that infrastructure we're asking businesses to put outside now in order for them to be able to serve uh, customers um, might not be a qualifying expense under the program now, but that definitely needs to be something that we look at. Is, is that possible to do as a policy point by the department? Um, that is not policy that is under the state statute and that is considered because it's like personal property, not permanent structure to the building. So when it like any investment there would be, they would be able to move it as they relocate it. So that as it stands right now, that is not an eligible, eligible use. However, not that all uh, business districts have this, but um, SSAs has been able to help um, supplement some of those costs through their programs. Um, but again, I, I hear you, we have to do more. And I, and we are not, um, as, we, as we finish this, as we finish this, we know moving forward, we have to find other mechanisms to help these businesses um, survive and maintain. But Commissioner and, and, Lopez, if I may add uh, also just to provide additional, um, information and, and background in some of the work that we that we do and sometimes frankly does not is, is, is above and beyond and it's really just part of the partnership that that BPD and summer core have and and the in the commitment to the small business community um, earlier this year as you know for instance uh, the city of Chicago the state of Illinois implemented a number of emergency grants uh, for small businesses we were able to quickly, because of the relationship that we have with small businesses through the SPIF program, were to be able to promote and market these grant programs. Uh, I'm also proud to say that um, when the pandemic uh, struck and, and the PPP program under the Small Business Administration program came online, we had a number of banks who actually contacted Summercore to ask if there were any 
small businesses that needed help. And they were looking to help businesses that did not have existing banking relationships. Again, we were quickly able to reach out to small, the, the Small Business Improvement Fund recipients and even businesses that had applied for the program and were not connected to the program. So there is a lot of work that goes into not only in the actual execution of the SPIF program itself, but also to provide additional support and services that go beyond the SPIF program. And that's, and that's just because it's, it's, it's frankly embedded and, and understood as, as the partnership that we have together. Um, so, you know, it's not just the SPIF and look, I, I agree with you, it would be great if we could do more, but we are also doing more beyond the SPIF because of this very unique partnership. And frankly, our collective understanding of, of the, you know, the needs and the, the, the various small businesses throughout our communities. Mary, I don't know if you wanted to speak to that as well. Yeah, it, sorry, Chairman, do you mind if I jump in for, I wanna listen yeah, to just, uh, Chip, if you just say your name and title for the record, that would be uh, great. For the record, Chip Hastings, Managing Deputy Commissioner in the Bureau of Economic Development. Um, so Alderman Lopez, you raised a couple of points that we've wrestled with, we struggle with. Uh, I, would just, I would just say that we, we operate and maintain a program that uh, has constraints, both geographically, financially, in terms of the statute that we have to uh, work within. Um, and in coming up with several of the changes that we've discussed today, part, partly what, part of what we're trying to accomplish is addressing those things. So you raised a good point about liquidity. We know from experience in other programs that we manage, as well as SPIF, that one of the biggest uh, one of the biggest problems that small businesses bump up against when trying to expand, when trying to grow their business is liquidity. It's critical. So um, I think one thing that we really have to talk about is, is one of the changes that we're making is related to escrow. I think it's a game changer in terms of us being able to help businesses. So an example you use as far as funding outdoor dining, uh, if we have a SPIF applicant that's doing a project we now allow them to have access and have granted access and support access to existing architects, construction professionals, so they can focus on what they do best and that's growing their business. So in the example, the issue that you raised, uh, if they're gonna do an outdoor dining space, they can focus their resources on the things that we can support uh, and we can get them money faster during escrow, which saves them money, makes it more easy or easier for them to access capital. So they can refocus the funds on what we can support quicker, faster, and greater percentage of the overall project costs on things that we're able to reimburse for. And they move <clears> the <throat> capital that they are safe from that savings into things that we might not be able to support, like uh, not permanent improvements, uh, like cash flow and that sort of thing. So we recognize it's imperfect, but we're confident that some of the changes that we're making, some of the things that we're doing will really help businesses grow over the course of the next couple of years. Uh, we're not going to be the silver bullet to solve things, all things related to COVID, but I strongly believe that some of the changes that we're making will really help small businesses on your corridors uh, and your colleagues as well and address some of the things, that, the issues that you've raised. Thank you. And if you could, just for our, for the public's sake, what are the items that are covered by SPIF? I think there's only like seven of them anyway. So it's essentially any, any capital improvements, um, permanent infrastructure systems, heating, cooling, facade work, uh, interior work, electrical, plumbing, um, tiling, everything that you would consider permanently affixed to the structure, embedded in the, in, in the system of the building, that sort of thing. Uh, what it doesn't cover, I think you mentioned or alluded to, are things that are not permanently affixed, like temporary, like furniture, uh, fixtures and equipment that's not part of the building system. Thank you, Chip, and thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Alderman. Um, and I just want to say, I'm not knocking summer car. I know you guys go above and beyond. <clears throat> but for me, with, when I look down Archer Avenue, I look down 47th Street, I know that there are businesses that would love to access BIF, but are all paranoid that they're not going to be here by the time this application rolls out. Telling them that we will help them with their plumbing and electrical or their heating when they have no one inside their businesses is almost like a slap in the face at this moment. Saying that we're not able to even entertain how to help them with this $60 million that we're asking over the next three years. Um, it, just, it just seems very hard to swallow and explain to people. Um, and I just wanna make that known from my end. Thank you, Chairman. 
Thank you. Uh, Alderman Dowell. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just wanted to uh, first uh, state that I support this new substitute ordinance and to thank the department for reaching out to delegate agencies to get their feedback on it and also to uh, making changes that were suggested by uh, some of the aldermen. Um, had one question regarding the application period. I believe, I just want to double check this. It's now 30 days and is that a change from another number or has it always been 30 days? Alderman, this is Mary. It has always been 30 days. Okay. Did you all give any consideration to increasing the application period to maybe 45 or 60 days? We felt that we were addressing um, the concerns of an applicant by um, having to sit, by giving him advance notice of when the application period would open. And we were thinking like prior to that, they would have ample time to prepare. And we are gonna um, put an effort and more energy in um, helping these applicants prepare. So that was, that was what we did instead of extending the uh, timeline. Okay, that's reasonable. Just was uh, just questioning that. Um, and I do understand that uh, because of the state authorization that th these dollars can only be used for capital and not operating. That's accurate? That is accurate. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move uh, to pass. Thank you, Alderman Dow. Um, I have a motion for approval by the same roll call vote used to establish quorum from Alderman Dowell. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All uh, those no. opposed? Uh, no, by Alderman Lopez, please. Alderman Lopez is no on the item number seven. <laughs> Anyone else opposed on this? Okay, thank you. In the opinion of the chair of the ayes have it with uh, the exception of Alderman Lopez voting no and the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Manny, for attending today. Thank you. Thank happy you, holidays to all. Stay safe and happy. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, item number eight is a communication recommending a proposed ordinance amending the municipal code by adding a new chapter 3-10. Uh, this Ordinance would create an additional benefit fund for municipal employees felled by COVID-19 if it's contracted in the course of their work. For a number of legal and logistical reasons, it's an imperative that we continue to engage the pension funds, workers, legal experts, and other essential stakeholders so that we don't unintentionally interfere with any of the other benefits afforded to municipal employees and their families. So both the ordinance and the appropriation attached require more conversation and vetting. Um, at this time, uh, I ask for a motion to re-refer this matter to the Joint Committee of Finance and Budget so we can fully consider both I'll these move the move proposed move. Uh, Thank you. I have a motion from Chairwoman Dowell. I'll take that motion and ask for approval by the same roll call you used Chairman, to I have my hand up. Alderman Lopez. I wish to speak to the motion to, ref re to refer to this Joint Committee. Um, since I have both chairman of the joint committees, can you explain when you intend to call this? Because obviously 235 days in finance during a pandemic, waiting to see if we're going to be able to provide the same kind of employee death benefit that we offer to police and fire. I'd like to make sure that the, committee, the joint committee will be meeting expeditiously before this leaves this body. Thank you, uh, Alderman. As I just stated in my comment, we will be meeting and reviewing it as quickly as possible. Well, do we have, so, do we have a timeline as what that would look like? Because it's- I didn't pick a date yet. So as soon as we pick a date, we'll let everyone in the committee, both committees know, and we'll call that meeting as quickly as possible. So with that, um, may I have uh, all those in favor of the motion for approval by the same roll call used to establish quorum. I say aye. 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 All those opposed? You can record me as no chairman. 
Thank you. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes. You're muted. Ladies and gentlemen, item number nine is a communicating uh, a communication transmitting reports of cases in which judgments or settlements were entered into into the month of November 2020. Um, these communications from the Department of Law uh, will be uh, placed on file with the city clerk. Mr. Chairman, it's all uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear who that is. Uh, is uh, Alderman Irvin? Alderman Irvin. Alderman uh, Irvin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I I was reading the uh, information that was in there and just trying to get some clarity on the number of FOIA cases that are requiring a court action and settlement. Um, can someone from the law department explain why these cases are, are landing in court uh, opposed to just being handled because uh, it's sounding like we're being found uh, in some form of liability on these matters and why are they getting all the way to court uh, before they're being dealt with? Yes, Alderman. Um, let's see. I, I know we had... Can you someone... repeat his question, Chair? I couldn't hear him. Hold on a second, Alderman Spazzato. Um, I didn't. What was, what was that? Was that Smith? What did you say? He's asking if you could repeat the question. Your your uh, voice is a little bit muted there, but he's inquiring about the FOIA requests and how they're ending up in court. So we have Jeff Levine on the call who can uh, give us a little background on that, if you will, Alderman Urban. I think Alderman Irvin, I think you're frozen up a little bit. I'm but we sorry. Have to... uh, okay, yeah. I think I'm back. Good. Um, I need that. Uh, I need that fresh internet connection uh, out here on the west side. I need y'all to help me out with that. But uh, the, I, I missed whatever was said in the last thirty seconds. Uh, I have Jeff Levine on the call who can answer the question about the FOIA request. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, Chairman, members of the committee. Jeff Levine, Law Department. Um, uh, Alderman Irvin, I regret after that after that buildup, I don't have any information um, available to my to me right now as to the reason for the um, increase of FOIA cases going to court. Um, I can say generally that um, over the last uh, couple of years, there has been an increase in um, using. Uh, FOIA as a as a point of leverage. You lost um, the driver's license yesterday. To seek uh, judicial relief, and um, I can consult with colleagues and get you a more detailed answer um, as soon as I'm able. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Jeff. Uh, just just something that was just jumped out when I was going through the uh, report. Thank you much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Alderman Irvin. All right, as I've stated, these will be placed on file with the clerk. Uh, item number 10 and 11 are authorizations for the payment of various small claims against the city and the denial of payment of various small claims against the city. If there's no objection, these items will be placed in the omnibus. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving on to the supplemental agenda. Um, Pardon me, Jeff Levine. Uh, Jeff, are you going to be speaking on these supplemental agenda items? Um, Chairman, I am available uh, to. I, I believe you've been provided with a um, with a summary statement on those. And um, yep. I'm after after you've done that. If there right. are questions, okay. I'm happy to do. Okay. Uh, I didn't know if it was you or okay. I see Victoria there. Hold on just a second, please. Then. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, next on our supplement, supplemental agenda are three litigation settlements proposed by the law department. The first case, Jamel Island et al. versus City of Chicago et al. arose out of the execution of a search warrant 
in June of 2018. In this case, the plaintiffs assert that the search of their first floor apartment at 5250 South Wells, located in the 9th District, was ed executed in an unlawful manner, and that two occupants of the apartment were subjected to an illegal strip search. The Law Department is recommending a settlement of $295,000, which includes attorney's fees and costs to resolve this case. Um, are there any questions for the Law Department? I have a question. Yes, uh, if you could raise, use the raise your hand function, but Alderman Irvin, go ahead, please. Yeah, well, where is the law department at? Why, why, why are you explaining these cases? I'm not. I'm just giving a quick summary, and they're going to jump okay. into it. Sorry. Oh, it's no uh, Victoria Benson law? is here. Victoria Benson is here from the law department. Oh, okay. Very well. Just uh, I was I thought we made a change or something we weren't aware of about these cases. Um, that's all. Thank you. Alderman Austin, did you have the same? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I heard you speaking out there. Sorry. Yeah, about that. I was going to ask the same thing. Uh, let me see who's. Mr. Chairman. Yes. If there's no, if there is no question for the law department or for, uh, any of the, uh, no, it just would be us then I moved to pass. Okay, on item number one on the supplemental agenda, I have a motion to pass from Alderman Austin. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. And sorry, excuse me, Chairman. Um, as a matter of procedure, um, just to be on the safe side, if you could maybe move passage by the um, forum roll call. Thanks, Jeff. All those, uh, excuse me, I have a motion for approval from Alderman Austin to pass by the same roll call used to establish quorum. Again, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Aye. Depending, the chair of the ayes have it. Our second proposed settlement, ladies and gentlemen, is Bowden versus City of Chicago. And I'm just giving a summary. Uh, this involves a lawsuit filed against the city and three members of the Chicago Police Department by Patrick Bowden, who was arrested and criminally charged in conjunction with unlawful possession of a firearm and held for approximately six months in Cook County Department of Corrections custody from February 9th, 2018 to May 25th, 2018 followed by about one year on home electronic monitoring before criminal charges were dropped. The criminal case was dropped following an adverse evidentiary ruling by the judge. The judge did not deem to be credible police testimony that the plaintiff had a firearm and threw it away when approached by police. This adverse finding could hamper city efforts to mount a successful defense in this case. This proposed settlement is for $162,500, which includes attorney's fees and costs. Are there any questions for the law department? Alderman Napolitano not deemed to be credible police testimony that the plaintiff had a firearm. They're claiming that 
he, he threw a gun, then there isn't enough evidence, but yet they recovered the gun? I'm, I'm confused. Certainly. Um, Alderman, the, uh, the arrest- Somebody from law department can maybe explain. Sure. Uh, again, Jeff Levine, law department. The, um, the arrest of plaintiff was captured on um, body camera, but did not capture um, the moment associated with um, when the uh, <clears throat> testifying officer said uh, he saw the uh, plaintiff throw the gun. Thus, there is no video to show how the gun uh, landed or how, how the gun happened to be where it was found. And um, as the chairman indicated in his summary, in the criminal court case, um, the judge was not um, receptive to uh, Chicago Police Department testimony um, as to the fact that they saw the plaintiff throw the gun. I mean, this, this, um, this has, has a lot of concern. I mean, before we had body cameras, um, testimony and and I, I don't know all of the circumstances of this to say um, you know what I, let me do this I, it was I, I, I'll talk with the law department again to get more information before we vote on Wednesday so um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to vote either way on this chair okay. um but uh, then let me take a look and I'll let you know by Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman Thompson. Alderman Moore. I apologize. Can you go over again what led to the arrest? Sure. Um, so this uh, arose out of um, uh, incidents occurring on February 9th of um, 2018. Uh, it was a snowy day and three um, CPD officers were members of a tactical team on patrol in Homan Square. Um, as they were driving along St. Louis Avenue, they observed a group of men standing in the middle of the street near a roundabout obscuring traffic. Um, the officers assert that as they approached the roundabout in their unmarked car, the group of men scattered and one of the men began walking north on St. Louis Avenue, walking up the middle of the street. Um, the officers will assert that they saw, um, they followed him in their car. They saw him walk onto the sidewalk. And as he saw their vehicle approach, that he reached into his waistband and um, pulled out a gun and threw it um, approximately half a block uh, up and across the street. They then, uh, two of the officers uh, jumped out of the passenger side, um, brought the plaintiff down and handcuffed him. And uh, a third officer uh, exited the driver's side, ran up the street and recovered uh, a handgun, which had landed it, which was sitting in a, um, had made a small crater in the snow where it had landed. The plaintiff, the state's attorney charged the plaintiff with offenses relating to the weapon. At the criminal trial, the uh, judge did not give credibility to the officer's testimony. The judge in the criminal trial uh, found that the officer, quote, testified uncredibly, found his testimony, quote, unbelievable, and concluded that the testimony that the plaintiff hurried away or threw a weapon was a quote, fabrication. Um, as a result, the criminal charges against the plaintiff were dropped. He had, however, up until the time that the charges were dropped, had spent six months in the Cook County Jail and another year on home monitoring. As a result, he brought this lawsuit asserting that the arrest was unlawful and seeking compensation for his time 
under restraint, which was essentially a year and a half. At this, this point in the civil case against the city, the city would face some challenges in defending it. I get it. I remember the rest of that. I, I just forgot some of it. And so I, what I didn't get to ask, because I came in on the tail end during the briefing, was is in that situation, can Prince by, be identified or was Prince checked on that gun or no? It, it was not possible. It was it, the there, it was it was um, wet from snow and there was no okay. uh, no ability to retrieve prints from. All right, thank you. And I urge anybody else who has some reservations about this because there's a question there um, to go watch the preacher's wife. I just watched it last night. Very clear, similar instance. All right, thank you. Thank you, Alderman Moore. And there's the law and there's TV. Um, does anyone else have any questions on Supplemental item B. What was it, Chairman? What's the settlement amount? A hundred. Go ahead, Jeff. One hundred sixty-two thousand five hundred dollars. That is that all you had, Alderman Cardenas? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's not in the millions, thank God. So yeah. Okay. Chairman. Uh, Alderman Austin. If there are no objections, I move to pass. Alderman Austin moves to pass by the same roll call used to establish quorum. All those in favor, with the exception of Alderman Napolitano, Thompson, Moore? I'm a yes. Yes, okay. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed? In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. That motion carries. Thank you. Um, the last item uh, on the supplemental item C is a proposed settlement that revolves around a lawsuit brought by plaintiffs Denigma Howard against the city and two Chicago police officers alleging claims of unlawful seizure, excessive force, and battery. These claims stem from an incident at Marshall High School on January 29, 2019, in which the plaintiff, who was at the time a 16-year-old student, asserts that officers used excessive force in removing her from school after she was suspended and asked to leave. The proposed settlement here is for $300,000, $300,000, and includes attorney's fees and costs. Are there any questions for the law department? Yeah, I need a summary of... Uh of uh, the incident. Okay, hold on one second. Certainly. Alderman, Cardenas, Jeff, could you uh, give more detail on this one, please? Sure. Um, again, these um, the lawsuit stems from an incident at uh, Marshall High School on January 29th, 2019. Um, the plaintiff was at the time uh, a 16 year old student at the high school. She was uh, instructed to leave the school for refusing to put away her cell phone during a test and then throwing a desk. Uh, school administrators and security officers responded but could not get her to leave. Her father was called to the school and arrived shortly before the defendant officers arrived at the school for their shift. The um, two officers uh, involved in this incident were assigned to work as school resource officers. When they arrived at the school, school security asked them to escort plaintiff to the first floor because she was suspended. At the second floor, the officers approached plaintiff and began speaking with her. They informed her that she was suspended and that her father was there to pick her up. Plaintiff objected and stated that she was not going anywhere. At that point, an altercation occurred um, on <clears throat> school video camera captures plaintiff uh, making a turning movement away from the officers. At this point, uh, one of the officers initiated physical contact with her by grabbing her in a uh, bear hug to bring her down the stairs and um, essentially um, they, they sledded down the second floor stairs to a landing and then again down 
a second set of stairs from the landing to the first floor with video um, showing the plaintiff being pulled uh, down by her leg and the other officer sliding down um, on her stomach. Um, plaintiff was eventually moved to the adjacent security office where she was detained before being taken to the hospital for treatment. Um, she was arrested and charged with misdemeanor and felony offenses, but um, those charges were dismissed one week later by the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. Uh, since the time of this case, CPD has modified their um, orders regarding the role of um, school resource officers to provide that they are only to physically engage um, with students uh, in the event of criminal conduct. And um, the uh, two officers at issue are um, no longer uh, serving as school resource officers. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think this goes to the heart of the fact that uh, these resource officers should not even be in schools or assigned to schools. I, I think it's a, it's a no win situation. That, that could easily be handled by allowing the students to stay until uh, class ended uh, and then uh, remove her privileges from entering the grounds the next day without uh, having all of this uh, uh, play out, uh, which I'm sure costs trauma uh, to the student, uh, unnecessary uh, injuries to the officers, uh, all because they came into enforced not an enforceable situation. So it's sad all around. I'm glad that they uh, uh, amended their policies. Yes, um, but I think they, they, they should just extricate themselves from these situations altogether, in my opinion. Uh, I ain't even at work. What happened? So, Emma, Emma, thank you, Alderman. Thank you, Alderman Cardenas. Uh, are there any other questions on item C of the supplemental? Or statements. If moved to pass. Uh, I have a motion to approve uh, from Alderman Dow using the same roll call used to establish quorum. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it, and item the motion on item C carries. Um, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that is all we have for this agenda. Um, I want to thank all of you for your hard work this year and um, patience shown despite a lot of the technical difficulties and frankly the uh, difficulties of this um, once in a century crisis with the pandemic. So I want to wish all of you uh, the best of the holiday season and uh, best wishes in 2021. And I, I just want to make another note that um, we will have Renee Rodney back, I think, in the beginning of the new year as she comes back from maternity leave for um, for the law department. So we want to wish her well. Now. Congratulations, Renee. Um, if there are no other questions, I ask for a motion to Motion adjourn. to adjourn, Alderman Spisato. That would be Alderman Spisato with a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Chairman. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All aye. those opposed? See you all Wednesday. Motion, motion approved. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good one.